Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Lin. I'm Assistant Professor of International Studies and Associate Chair of the Taiwan Studies Program here at the University of Washington. Uh, welcome to our, our next event in the new book series for the Taiwan Studies Program. We're very lucky to have Professor Nikki Alsford here joining us to talk about his newly released, fresh off the press book, uh, Taiwan Lives, or as Lori and I had discussed many years ago when we first were discussing titles, could alternatively be read as Taiwan lives. And so I don't know, Nikki, what, which one you think is the official version, um, but I think that, that duality is, a, is an interesting part of how we've chosen this title. Um, Taiwan Lives or Taiwan Lives is the first book in our new University of Washington Press series, Taiwan in the World. And so not only is this an important event for, for Nikki, it is also an important event for the Taiwan Studies Program uh, to have this, this inaugural launch event for the series. Um, this is something that we had been discussing, uh, Bill, uh, me, and, and Dong Yue, Madeline Dong, had been discussing for many years. I think our initial discussions were 2018. And so um, 2024, to have this first book finally out is just an immense accomplishment. And we're very thankful to um, to Lori Hagman, uh, as well as to, to David, Molly, and Caitlin at the University of Washington Press for all of their work in getting this series launched. So, um, oh, by the way, I should mention, uh, David from UW Press is outside. Uh, he is selling physical copies of the book at a 30% discount. So if you want to grab it while it's still hot, you can do so right after the talk outside from David. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Nikki. Uh, Nikki Alsford is professor in Asia Pacific Studies and director of Asia Pacific Institutes at the University of Central Lancashire. In addition, he is research associate at the Center of Taiwan Studies at SOAS, the University of London, and an associate member of the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Oxford. Uh, Alsford is the author of uh, his, his first book, Transitions to Modernity in Taiwan, The Spirit of 1895, and the session of Formosa to Japan, which is published by Rutledge in 2017. Um, this is his, his next book, uh, obviously, which we will talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, and you can also ask him about his future upcoming books. He has another very exciting book coming up from Rutledge um, that uh, is thematically exploring different issues that he's often taught about, such as, was it peacemaking and uh, other sorts of divisions that societies face across the world today. And I don't want to belabor this anymore, so uh, let's give a warm round of applause to welcome Professor Nikki Alston. <clears throat> Thank you very much um, for a warm introduction. Um, just as a way of disclosure, I um, arrived yesterday um, and my body is saying that I should now be in bed. Um, so I do feel a little bit laggy. So if I start yawning, I'm not bored of my own presentation. Um, but I apologize in advance that I may just come across as a little bit sleepy. But um, but let's start. Um, so um, as with any book, it's always good to start with acknowledgements. And so I want to kind of start with some big thanks. Um, big thanks to, to Bill Averly, Madeline, Dong, and James, the series editors, for, for, for liking my proposal um, and sticking with me um, as, we, as we move forward into the publication of the book. And again, I want to probably then further express my gratitude to all of those I was working with from University of Washington Press, Laurie Hagman, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting two years ago at the World Congress, has uh, has been so important in, in, in from from its very early inception as a proposal into the the final sending off the drafts, going out for peer review. I want to say thank you to Marcella Landry, Molly Warbright, Joa Zuko, all of these who have been really important in correspondence and anybody else that I haven't mentioned, I thank them wholeheartedly. Um, a big, big thanks must go to all of those at the North American Taiwanese Professors Associations that very, very kindly um, awarded a mere grant to to begin the processes of writing this. I, I I am truly grateful, obviously, for that. I 
took way longer than I initially had said in my proposal to do this. So um, I'm, I suspect that they're quite glad to see the final product just as much as, as I am. Um, so I kind of, it's really quite interesting. How do you talk about kind of a book? Because obviously that book has been such a huge part of my life for for so long now that it's always got to the point where you feel almost quite tired of talking about the book. But I now need to kind of now once again speak about it with the enthusiasm I had at the beginning of writing the book. Um, and so I think probably be a good idea to kind of talk to you about this book as a journey, right? Um, and um, it it came to me through a series of storytellings might be a way of talking about this. I have at home or in my office boxes of research projects. Some have gone through and become publications, whether this is as, as a book or as an edited volume or as a peer reviewed journal. Others are collections of interviews. Um, and these boxes of research is all been part of a fairly long journey and an opportunity to bring some of that research together. Um, and so when I was thinking about how, how to put this book together, um, I was thinking about having a book where you have a beginning, a middle and an end, but a book where I didn't want to ever say it's completed because when we have or a story, or when we tell stories of Taiwan, it's the, there isn't an end, right? It's something that's still continuing. And so I was thinking about kind of other kind of books that perhaps have a very similar no ending. Um, and um, I decided to do something quite strange, um, and that was to model a contemporary book on, on Taiwan on the Canterbury Tales. Um, and I did so because the Canterbury Tales is a storytelling contest amongst people um, and it's incomplete. The 24 tales that make up the Canterbury Tales are known to be incomplete, that there were other tales. Um, and so the same thing was happening to me in terms of storytelling. So whether this was me speaking to different people at coffee shops, tea houses, Pubs often, you know, I'll be chewing the ear off the passenger on the long haul flight, just talking about the things that I am passionate about. But this inception of this book has come through these conversations. And so what I wanted to do is to kind of almost not necessarily copy that, but to draw inspiration from the Canterbury Tales to present to you 24 tales of Taiwan. And that's what's in this book. Um, James has already talked about the title. I, when the title, because my my initial in my proposal was just a social and political history, right? Um, and then they came to me with this, and I instantly loved it, simply on the basis because of its multiple interpretations. I'm not going to say that there is a correct one, right? This, because that I think will ruin ruin it. Um, about which one I prefer, but instead this is up to the reader. And this is also a really important bit because, again, this is about a relationship with the reader, right? About their following their tales to tell stories and for them to think about what other tales that they may have put in based on their own experiences, their own life worlds, or their research. And you perhaps will come up with different tales. So there's not a set 24 tales, there are many tales, and they are always changing. Um, so um, that gives you a kind of a context to how I began this journey. Um, the order of the book was also another thing that was important. What I did want to do is to create something that could be quite teleological, where I wanted to, where you almost are saying that there is an end, right? You know, so my the book ends with the president's tale, but we don't want it to be that that's the end. And, saying when the president's tale is not the end, right? So I didn't want to follow something that is purely chronological, right? Because it gives the impression that it is an end or has an end. But at the same time, if it was just 
everywhere, they wouldn't have a flow. So what I did is combi combining both a set of chronologies, so there, there is a flow, but to include a thematic element um, without there being confusion. I hope that kind of makes sense. So it, the book is in sections that are thematic, and each section has a flow that follows almost follows a chronological line. Um, and hopefully it's one that isn't confusing. Um, so I want to kind of start with a conversation um, with you now on map. I want to start with a map. Um, and we do so in the book as well. Um, and I want us to think about when we think about Taiwan as a geography, we need to try to make sense of this. And how do we think about Taiwan um, is something that's really important to me. Um, and then when we think about it as an environment, we need to think about how did in the past and how do in our present period humans interact and affect the environment um, and how the environment influences and affects people whether or not that this is based on their belief systems or the way in which the, the crops that they grow. Um, all of these things impact both the environment itself, but the environment has an impact on others. So I want to kind of start with thinking about how do we situate Taiwan? And this book really is a beginning of a kind of a quest for me to start thinking about how we frame Taiwan. Um, and so for me, there are two main ways in which that we can frame Taiwan. One is that Taiwan existing on an edge of a continent. See, that continent is Asia. It sits on the continental shelf, right? So it is both physically, geographically, and geologically a part of a continent, right? But the stories that we would tell and the tales that we would listen to um, when we think about Taiwan as being a continental, is a very land-based. It's quite colonial, right? Um, and we can think about this as a movement of people to the island, right? Whether this is whether this was historically or even to some extent contemporary. When we start to think about movement of people, ideas, and how these shape the social environment as something that's very inbound, coming into the island, right? It's very land-based. But there are other ways in which that we can frame Taiwan. And one of the thoughts for me, and this does link and tie to, to, a, to a book that I'm co-editing um, as, as an edited volume on Taiwan as existing on the edge of an ocean. Okay, that ocean is the Pacific. And when we start to think about Taiwan and the stories of Taiwan existing on the edge of an ocean, we can start to think about that migration as being outbound. And so whether or not that this is in deep history, so the movement of Austronesian languages from Taiwan out through the Philippines and into the wider Pacific, or we can start to see this in a more modern period with this kind of migration or movement of people from Taiwan to the United States, for example, has a very much that outbound migration, then the ocean is playing a role within this. And so although the book itself doesn't confront this directly as a, as a question, um, that question has sat with me in how I decided to make up my 24 tales. And so when we think about this in terms of a map and, and the Taiwan as ocean, we can think about this in maps such as this. This, this isn't a map that is in the book, but this was a, a map that's produced of the Formosan languages. So we need to think about Taiwan as being linguistically diverse, but the languages that make up the diversity of this, again, carry in these two ways that we look, these two narratives, whether we look at Taiwan as continent, as an edge of the continent, or Taiwan on the edge of an ocean, the 
the questions that we would ask, the research that we would do if we were looking at it purely linguistically would vary. So here we can see that these is a map made up of the indigenous languages. Some are now gone, extinct languages, where others are still there. Some are endangered while others are thriving. One of these languages became all of the languages spoken, Austronesian languages that came out through the Philippines and into the Pacific. And we can start to see how Taiwan and the importance of Taiwan, or as Jared Diamond said, its gift to the world, is to look at the geographical extent of the languages. And we think about that outward flow, we can start to think about it this way. So I just kind of want to situate and ground the book um, for you in how I conceptually think about Taiwan or how I'm thinking about Taiwan. And that help you to kind of inform why I chose some of the stories that I have chosen. What I want to use this kind of re remaining of this kind of launch is I'm going to not just kind of go through each of the 24 tales, but rather I'm going to now select to you some, um, some of those tales and explain why I have chosen those, 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 those characters, those people. Um, and the first story um, has a really kind of quite a long history with me. Um, and he makes up the first of the tales. Now, this goes back to when I was a master's degree student um, in Taiwan at National Jinji University. I was in the library at Shida, National Taiwan Normal University. Um, and as I was going, to, going through the library collections, I came across a diary that was uncatalogued. It was sit behind the other books. And it's kind of a bit of a surprise. It was almost like I, you know, it has the storyline beginnings of Nicolas Cage's National Treasure 3 or 4 or what have you. It's definitely got that feel to it. And that's how I felt in finding this. And this diary was written by a British merchant who complained a lot about the blockade during the Sino-French War, the blockade of Taiwan from 1884 to 1885. And he wrote in his diary that it's just, just, just complaining. But it gave a really interesting account of life in Danshe in northern Taiwan. Um, and so I, I began to think about this diary, and I approached a publisher in Taiwan, um, SMC publisher, Nantian, um, to see whether I could publish an annotated version of this diary. So see, the diary did not sit in any form of copyright, um, and I wanted to, to annotate it, so where this kind of, to kind of put like a contemporary edge on some of the things that he was talking about so that I can gave, give it some context. Um, and so I did this. And so one of the first thing I started to do as a kind of a junior detective was to try to locate who he was. Um, I found from a government paper that this gentleman, John Dodd, died in Wales, um, in a very small village in the Welsh Valleys in, North, in Northern Wales. Um, and um, I had a little look in there, and there was a blog. And the last entry in the blog was like five or six years prior to me searching. But it had a contact. And so I from Taiwan as a master's degree student, just wrote into the comment um, that I'm doing this project on it. Turns out that the person who read the comment was the descendant of John Dodd's sister, who which at that time I had no knowledge. We just, most books were saying he was Scottish. Others said that he was English. There's a few that said he was American. So no one really kind of knew who he was, right? And so, through that, I then managed to locate both his death certificate and his birth certificate. And he's born in Preston in England. And it's a huge coincidence that that's where my university is situated now, right? And so um, I, I began to then do more work on John Dodd. And one of those boxes that I was telling you is stuff that's kind of followed that uh, that book that was published in 2010. So it's stuff that's not in that book, right? Um, and that's what I mean by this kind of collection of things. So I've been in contact with his family. So John Dodd um, had a relationship with a woman in Hong Kong 
Um, he fathered two children from that relationship. And um, I've managed to have conversations with the descendants of those children. And those children have very colorful lives that go from being interned in the prison in Shanghai during the war to others who are now work for the ministry in Fiji. So it's, they've got the interesting stories um, themselves. Um, and so I wanted to kind of include a bit more on him in the book. So we begin with that. Now, you may ask, aside from just kind of moving and living in Taiwan, um, what, what did he do? Um, and so one of the things that he did do with, with, with his middleman, um, Li Chen who has his own tail in the book, is to instigate the tea industry in Taiwan. And that would have a profound effect, not just on situating Taiwan now within an, within almost an international commerce, right? But it also had a, a, it also had an effect on the demographic shifts from the southern parts of Taiwan to the northern parts, right? Um, whereby the harbors of Dao Dao Chen, Jilong, and Danshui all were starting to be formed around these changing industries. New waves of migration, inbound migration coming from places like Fuzhou, where the experiences of firing tea started to come. So Dao Dao Chen as a place just north of Taipei City itself. Um, so it started to kind of have the factories for the firing of tea. Dodd was also a person who, on many of his wanderings that Victorians tended to do, was to answer a question about this fire coming off of the mountain. Um, and he found that that fire was due to petroleum deposits. And so Shell Oil Company, they had a bit of a role to play, though, that didn't move much further than just a kind of a general survey. And that general survey over petroleum is what kind of led me to another character who's not in the book. Because for me, it was a decision whether to put John Dodd or this other character called Charles Shuttleworth. Now, I met Charles. So Charles was one of the people who I did an ethnographic work when I, when I was in Taiwan. Um, Charles, interestingly, was from Lancaster. So, I mean, UK geography. So Preston and Lancaster are about five minutes, six minutes on the train. So we're not, we're talking about quite close. And it's quite interesting that Charles moved to Taiwan in the 1960s, lived in the house of John Dodd. And this is what, this is the picture of the house. The house now is gone. It burnt down. Um, but if anyone has been to Dan Shui, they've got the site of where the Shell company was established. And the house is, if you peek through, it's um, some of the kind of wild overgrown camphor trees, which interestingly, John Dodd talks about planting in his garden, which now is just this kind of huge wild thing. Um, but Charles came in the 1960s. Now, he wasn't very clear about why he came to Taiwan. He said that he can't really talk about it, but he was in Malaysia fighting communists in Malaysia and was invited by the government to come to Taiwan. Um, and he said that his co the cover of the work which he was doing was something to do with telegraph wires. Um, but he was always a bit vague about what he did. But he also um, helped to establish um, animal conservation on the island. So I didn't include his tale, though. I do feel that there's a lot that he could bring. But it just felt that the story of John Dodd and Charles kind of intersects a bit. Um, and it didn't make sense to do to do one purely on Charles itself. Um, however, my ethnographic work with Charles was not the only Taiwanese person or a person in Taiwan that I did ethnographic work when I was living there. Um, and that led me to this person. And I, re and I really was really pleased and fortunate to have my opportunity to kind of work with Jin Su Qin. Um, Jin Su Qin was a Wai Shen Ren. She came over from the Chinese mainland um, in 1947. Um, now, her story is an interesting story. Um, as a child, she was, her mother wanted to bind her feet um, and she kept unbinding them. 
And then it was to the point that the mother gave up trying to bind her feet and said that if she doesn't want to bind her feet, then she can go out and work in the farms, um, of which uh, Su Tin was quite fine to do. She was the only girl in the village that was riding around on a bicycle. Um, and she talks about that freedom that she has. Um, she refers to herself um, as a feral child, she used to say, but these are her words, not my words, right? Um, and Jin Su Chin, she said she was a bit wild. And then in 47, um, her cousin, who was married to a pilot from the Flying Tigers, was moving to, was relocating to Taiwan. Um, her cousin um, had her feet bound, but had a baby and said, Would you like to come? And then uh, Jin Su Chin was like, yeah, sure, why not? I'm, I'm not doing anything today. Um, kind of idea with the idea that it's not going to be a permanent thing and I'll just help you with the baby. Um, she came over, but in order for her to get through, she had to pretend that she was not cousins, but sister. And so she changed her name and her name was Chen Su Chin. And so she arrived in Taiwan as Chen Su Chin. Um, the Chen family moved and relocated to the United States, asked if she wanted to move to the United States, but she felt that she was just a, like an unpaid babysitter and said that no, and started to make a life for herself in Jai, um, in southern Taiwan. And um, I had an absolute pleasure for about almost five years of just talking to this, to this woman um, about her life. So she came to Taiwan not for political reasons, but because she had nothing better to do. Um, she got married. Um, when she died, she passed away in 2012. And when she died, the last thing that she asked her son, her eldest son, was to change her name back to Jing, of which she did. Now, um, I'm beginning to do a bit more work that's actually come since the, the writing of this book and found that actually she has a very interesting Manchurian heritage. Um, and so maybe the second edition, right? <laughs> um, could do a bit of an update on, on that part of her story. And this is what I like about the thing that these are constantly more information to going into these boxes of research. Um, and here is a picture that she was with her husband. Um, and so that was one of the tales that I wanted to tell. Um, um, and uh, another one that um, has a very interesting connection with is uh, Shoki Ko. Now, Shoki Ko um, was an activist. He, he himself has a, quite an interesting bit, and I want to just kind of perhaps read a bit from, from the book on this. Um, so Shoki was born in August 1914 in Zhonghua, in central Taiwan. Um, and the Shoki comes from Shoka, which was the word for Zhonghua in Japanese. Um, and his grandfather was the first in the family to convert to Christianity. Um, his, Shoki's father wanted the first son of the family to go work in the ministry. Um, his eldest son sadly passed away um, in a shipwreck. And so it, it fell on Shoki to be the one to be sent. So he went to um, Japan to be educated. Um, and then after Japan to take up a, a graduate in theology, a, as a graduate student in theology at the University of Cambridge. Um, it was in Cambridge where Shoki was when war broke out. Um, now, for Shoki, he then became an enemy in the eyes of many within the UK. And obviously, that story resonates a lot amongst Japanese people here in the United States. Um, but for Shoki, it he he was able to to kind of continue his work because he because the relationship that he had with the ministry and i just want to kind of talk to you about 
a particular event that happened in 1940 was that the Presbyterian Church Overseas Committee for, came together along with members of the British Foreign Office to discuss the evacuation of British personnel from Taiwan in 1940, where they were being expelled. Um, and Shoki's role that he played within the eventual evacuation of both the mission, but also the consulate, as well as members of the, the business community, um, meant that during the war itself, Shoki was given um, was kind of allowed to kind of continue to, to work. Um, he took up a job teaching Japanese at SOAS, the University of London, my alma mater, um, and also worked for the BBC World Services. So he had a very interesting kind of um, life during the war years. Um, however, um, in 1940, I think, it's just now I've got to remember what I wrote, right? Um, 1948, I want to say that, but 1948, he was to relocate to Taiwan. Um, and it was in Hong Kong that his idea of his sense of himself, about who he was, started to kind of change. He saw somebody who was working at the ministry, um, who was in Taiwan, came to Taiwan in 1947 and witnessed the 228 incident firsthand and told Shoki, don't go to Taiwan. But Shoki had this sense of kind of a belonging, but didn't know what that belonging was, right? Um, but it began to shape him. And he wrote an article um, on called uh, One China, One Formosa. And he wrote it with a Sri Lankan pastor. Um, and where, with the idea that, like, like, like India, but not the partition of Pakistan and India, but rather of Sri Lanka and India, um, perhaps offered a solution to one Formosa, one China. Um, those words meant that he was exiled for those, those comments, and he, like many others, would live in exile. Um, and I was quite fortunate to meet with, I never got the chance to meet Shoki. Shoki passed in 1988, of which I was still very young. Um, but um, I did get an opportunity to speak to his family, descendants of his family. And so they, you know, they, they shared their family pictures, their family archives with me. And so I was able to do some research and I've published elsewhere on Shoki Co himself, but I wanted to talk more about kind of that wider, the wider context to which the Shoki himself lived. And so that made up one of the tales. Um, another kind of story that really kind of resonated from my own personal experiences of working with them is Fan Yun. Um, so Fan Yun is a legislator in Taiwan. In 2012, I think it was 2012, um, she was a visiting scholar at SOA. So I was there as a PhD student and Fan Yun was there. And I, I feel that her story as, as, a, as a youth activist through the, through the wild strawberry movement upwards was really kind of resonates quite well with situating activism within Taiwan itself. And so, um, so I wanted to use kind of Fan Yun's activism as a way of telling that story. Another kind of interesting one that came about from my research was with regards to Jack Edwards. Um, so Jack Edwards was a prisoner of war in Taiwan in 1942. Now, an interesting thing about Jack Edwards is that when he writes about his account of landing in Jilong and being marched to Jingguashi of where he would remain as a prisoner of war, is that his story um, actually intersects with another person called Tang Yu. Now, Tang Yu was a child at primary school in Jingguashi, and he wrote an account of seeing these prisoners of war arriving in Jilong. Now, 
Tang Yu makes no reference whatsoever of knowing who Jack Edwards was, the book that he wrote. And of course, Jack Edwards didn't makes no reference at all to Tang Yu. But they but they write a very interesting thing. So when I was able to locate both archives, I was able to kind of piece it together. And I will just momentarily just kind of read um, from that. So yes, as I said, Tang Yu, an elementary student from Jing Shu, who was present at the time, remembers the teacher. And the teacher announced that these Western prisoners would arrive and that they were permitted to witness it. So the teacher at that point sternly reminded them that they must remain quiet as their behavior reflected on their nation. Shortly after 2 p.m., the children witness the prisoner's arrival. Edwards recalls being greeted, not quietly, as their teacher had wished, but the noise of children's voices in excitement and derision. As the men were wearing only shorts and military boots, March Tang remembers that most of them had green eyes and long red hair on their arms. And he recalls that some were being carried in stretchers. So what I wanted to do here was not only to talk about the kind of the prison of war camps in Taiwan itself, but because the task of Jack Edwards was to mine copper, um, is to talk about mining more generally in Taiwan. So I, I, I looked at it not just as a prisoner of war, but also as a miner. Um, and so that was one. There was, I tried, COVID did, I will talk a bit more about COVID in a moment, but essentially the book was written mainly in lockdown. Um, and I wanted to to locate a story, um, and I would have done a miner's tale had I've located this story of a Korean miner. Um, however, I had, was not able to get access to the material and to do the work to give it enough justice. So I mean, I I then put these two tales into one tale. So it, he was both the prisoner's tale, but also the miner um, himself. Um, the war years, the interwar years, I found to be always a very interesting one, a way in which that we can think about how Taiwan is shaped. Um, and um, I, in one of my conversations this time, both in the coffee shop, in a tea house, and on, on, on the MRT with Jonas Chung, who is a scholar of Taiwan, um, does a lot of kind of local history, um, stuff was he talked to me about the Shenenko, which is the child laborers. Um, these were young people um, between 12 to 19 years of age, um, were recruited to go to Japan to assist in the manufacturing of aircraft. Um, and uh, Chumbi Gray was one of those child laborers. Um, and so he, in his own accounts, talks about life as a laborer, child laborer, um, the, the joys that they had of being naughty around one of the supervisors who was friendly. Um, but one of the key things I wanted to get across in the book was the problems of repatriation of them at the end of the war. For the Korean child laborers, they were repatriated to Korea um, relatively Easy, easily, right? The repatriation of the Taiwanese was more complicated um, to the point to the point where they were told to remain within the camp. They were overlooked by the U.S. military and the Japanese police. They all child was issued with a copy of Sun Yat-sen's Three Principles of the People, and was told that this is now your nation. Um, and Chen Pei Gray talks about just not understanding any of this. Um, for him, he was Japanese. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to kind of locate that in, in the tale. Um, and the kind of the stories within this book kind of follows this through. And there's uh, other images that, um, you know, it, 
if it was able, I'd love to have included images of kind of the Kaohsiung incident. Um, here we have, okay, these kind of, remember this is during a, still during the period of martial law, these protests against the US switching diplomatic recognition. We have protests in um, over the, the Dupont in Lugan. And so these kind of images just, I feel, really kind of tell you something about the lives of the Taiwanese. And here we can see the veterans and the outbreak of sadness at the death of Zhang Jingguo, right? And we can clearly see this. Um, uh, then I kind of wanted to still situate this kind of post-war Taiwan martial law by looking at stories which we don't tend to look at. Um, and then I kind of want I started to look at Arthur Wolf. Now, this would have been a really good moment, a segment, and one for you all to come back in the autumn when we start to talk not, sadly not, with Arthur as he passed away, um, and we're not doing seances. Um, but we do have people who can talk about those experiences. Um, his PhD students who are all elderly themselves now, um, or getting older, I'm not sure they like me calling them elderly, but of getting older now. Um, uh, I'll be there to kind of talk about how, although many had come to Taiwan to study it as a surrogate for the China that was closed for US scholarship, they became instrumental in the formation of Taiwan studies as a discipline in and of itself. Um, and so I wanted to kind of include that story as the anthropologist tales, my background being in anthropology, I felt the kind of the types of anthropology that were being done. Um, and I, the book talks about this, this kind of how these scholars came to Taiwan, um, the types of subjects that they were, they were researching, um, and what that said about the differences between Taiwan, China, Taiwan, Japan. Um, I'm kind of mindful of the time. Um, I, did, I, I said to James, I've got a habit once I get started, it's really hard to stop. Um, and when you and when, and when it's your book launch, right, you know that you're not on that kind of 15 minute timer. But I, I promise that I will um, I will start to kind of wrap it, wrapping it up. But I'll, I, I want to just kind of return momentarily to that point I was saying about COVID. Um, I, I am a I am somebody who prefers to go into work rather than work from home. Um, and although I was fortunate enough that I have a space within my home, which I can call a, an office, um, most of the stuff that I do is in my office at work. Um, now, lockdown in the UK um, happened really quickly. Um, basically, our then Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, said, I see we're in lockdown. Um, and then the university was like, okay, no access to the buildings. Um, so it meant that for six to seven months, I had no access to all, any of my material, these research boxes, though I knew exactly where they were. I knew exactly where the book that I desperately needed is on the shelf. Um, I worried about my plants um, and I had no access. Um, surprisingly, one survived. <laughs> Um, I, and he's doing well. Um, the others, sadly, not so much. Um, so the writing of this book was was a little bit different. Um, and I kind of almost felt like um, Professor uh, Kusakabe from My Neighbor Totoro and just the kind of my room started just to get filled up of different stuff around me as I was trying to piece it together. So that's the reason why I've got that image. Everyone's thinking, what, why, why is... Um, that, but it also meant that I hadn't planned to do a tale of um, epidemiology, right? I didn't plan to do that tale, but I felt that it was important to think about how, at the time I was struggling to write, the people who I knew in Taiwan were sitting in coffee shops, sitting in tea houses, and the response was different like we were really bad at it and they seemed to be really good at it and i feel a lot of this was because of chen chinren um who um became so instrumental as a 
epidemiologist um, back in 2002, 2003, and Taiwan's response to SARS. Um, and he played a role within the COVID. There were others I could have done that became important, like Audrey Tang, uh, the digital minister. She played a crucial role about how to prevent misinformation and kind of almost controlling the narrative. And so I, I felt talking about the SARS, um, I think, became an important part of how Taiwan managed. Um, and that kind of then brings me on to, to the last of, of the images. That is me. I don't know what happened, right, much to my hair, right? I mean, this, so if you, anyone has curly hair, Taiwan is a really bad place for curly hair, right? Um, and I, but I think it's the light um, that created this almost Californian look. Um, so I don't really quite know what happened to my hair. But anyway, I had the opportunity to meet Tsai Ing-wen in 2009. And I think um, I was really pleased that I managed to get the book finished before her term had ended. So the book, um, as I said, it's not really an end, but the, it, it kind of is a way in which that the legacy of Tsai Ing-wen is to be written, right? Um, and it's already beginning. There's already people beginning to start looking at her terms in office, even before her term in office is formally finished. Um, for me, I think it's important to note that she um, it, it w was the president of the status quo. Um, and for me, the concept of the status quo is a very interesting concept when we think about this, this idea of kind of almost this social inertia, right? This, this desire for no change. Um, and to me, I feel that her, including her tale was an important tale for the president's tale. Um, there are many presidents of which could have been done. I felt that hers was was the most fitting to as a way of kind of bringing the 24 tales. Um, so just as a way of kind of closing, um, I want to read to you the conclusion. It's a short conclusion, so please bear with me. Um, so the history of Taiwan is made up by its people. Although the tales presented here in this book are separated by as much as 100 years, crossing colonial layers, they congregate in certain areas in Taiwan. Um, and this is one of the interesting things that came out. Now, my, my PhD was to look at one year in Taiwan history, 1895. Um, and I looked at it in Chen, so mapped three streets and just documented what they said about this transition to from to transition to Japan. Um, and that became the base, my PhD thesis was written up, became the base of my book with Routledge, with Routledge, which James talked about transitions to modernity. But Dao Dao Chen is a really interesting place for which that this took place. So Dao Dao Chen in Taipei shaped multiple narratives. Um, as a hub of radical thought, it has been globally situated since the late 19th century. It is a place of migration, a home to the semi-exiled. It is a site of marginality and of nostalgia. In a sense, it was the Canterbury to many of the set of tales within the book. The course of, the 19, of, course of Taiwan from the 19th century to the present has passed through three stages or three phases. The first phase marked a period of separation. It is not part of China, but it does have a connection to a Chinese social cultural heritage. It is not part of Japan, but it has a Japanese colonial heritage. It is a thing in itself. Martial law and the white terror that accompanied it constituted a transitional or liminal phase. And having completed this metaphorical rite, Taiwan has assumed its new identity. Its task now is to enter the international community with this new status. The only force that pre presently stands in its way is the PRC, which falsely believe that it, for it to complete its own quest to assume a new identity, a mission that it has assumed since 1949, it must include Taiwan. 
With the passage of time, however, the people of China might realize that even as an independent country, Taiwan can offer China brighter prospects. It too can pass through these three stages without Taiwan. And I wanted to kind of draw on Denny Roy's book, um, uh, Taiwan, A Political History, which provided much inspiration for the way in which I wanted to put this forward. Another core kind of academic writer, author, that helped shape me is Shauna Yang Ryan's book, Green Island. Um, and so I end the book by borrowing from Shauna Yang Ryan. The scene, a warm day in March under a perfectly blue sky, as a small group of friends sit on the banks of Taiwan's most northerly mountain range. Dr. Zai switching to Taiwanese as there is a Japanese family picnicking under the tree beside him, whispers to his future wife, we are curious creatures. We Taiwanese orphans, eventually orphans must choose their own name and write their own stories. The beauty of orphanhood is the blank slate. And so different people with different tales, many more than the 24 that I depict here, have chalked their presence upon this slate. And so for the people of Taiwan, this book is for you. Thank you very much. And then if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, I can't really say X, it sounds, sounds, sounds <laughs> um, but anyone that wants to follow my work um, or email me, please feel free. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we are now in our question and answer period. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, you can leave your question in the comment section of YouTube or Facebook. And we will see that here. And I'll go ahead and ask those questions to Nikki. Um, so any questions so far from our audience? Margaret, go ahead. Hi, Margaret. At the beginning, you mentioned people of Taiwan in the ocean town and the perspective of cultural pieces, peoples, and like the Formosa or indigenous languages. However, in, like, in contemporary Taiwan, indigenous people, despite like, being the minority in, in, in terms of public the lack of political uh, representation and substantial power. As a researcher and descendant of Indigenous people, I would like to ask that throughout the journey of writing this book, can you share regarding the transformation uh, of this or Asian um, or Indigenous narratives in contemporary Taiwan? And what developments do you foresee in the future uh, through such narrative perspectives? And the existence of indigenous peoples in Taiwan. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your your question. Um, so in my in my book of tales, um, situating an indigenous narrative became a really important component. And so um, on more than one tale, I talk um, about indigenous stories. Um, I I feel that to kind of part of my process or thought process is to think about other ways in which that we can look at Taiwan. I feel that framing Taiwan as ocean um, provides greater opportunity to think about these tales. Um, and the way, so just to try to think about your question in terms of future. So, um, Margaret, if you can help me. Um, so, for the future, for what? I mean, because indigenous people in Taiwan provide, like, we only take a lot of 2% of the population. But this existence sometimes were emphasized. Uh, many like books or research, especially in the Taiwan sector. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, even an impression that indigenous people are really important to the narratives of Taiwan. But in the reality, we were often ignored by the authority. Right. Yeah, and we don't have like really substantial political power to decide anything. So it becomes a, 
I think an interesting phenomenon that like in the research or on the paper, indigenous people or the existence of South indigenous people become um, like a very important thing for, for Taiwan or the security of Taiwan. Right. But, but it is not true in our daily lives. So I'm just wondering, how do you like, see this phenomenon? Or is there any like insights you you gain in this like journey when you are writing these books? What, how do you feel about? It? Yeah, um, I think it's you. You're correct. I think it is a sad reality. Mm -hmm. um, it is a reality of most indigenous peoples who who live as a minority um, due to settler colonialism. Um, uh, and we can see similar stories being played out elsewhere, whereby the the writing of that culture um, or those cultures um, become important, but the reality is somewhat different. If we think of the First Nations in Canada, Native Americans here, um, think about Australian Aborigines, um, the Maori in New Zealand. So there are many examples where um, where that there is an expression of writing and importance, but the lived reality of many of the people is different. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, I feel though that there is a lot that can be learned um, and it kind of close to the type of work that I currently engage with. And this will be how certain knowledge systems can better prepare us um, for the changes that we're seeing within our environment. Um, and I feel that the knowledge that sits amongst different indigenous groups, both within, within Taiwan, but also where there are other indigenous peoples, um, is going to be an, an important factor in how we, um, as humans, will respond or can learn to adapt to changing circumstances. That knowledge that exists is going to be an important thing moving forward. And I feel that um, it is starting to happen, um, but I think more will be done. I hope that address. Yeah, but thanks, Margaret. Thank you. If I could ask a quick follow-up yeah. question to Margaret's question, I hope this might help illuminate um, maybe what some of the points that Margaret is getting at. Could you tell us about the chapter on Rowan? I, I, I apologize if I'm not right. pronouncing it correctly, but I think that might um, offer a, maybe a concrete kind of answer to how you approach Indigenous voices. I thought Rowan's story was very interesting, especially because Rowan is a part of the Takusago yeah. volunteer army, you know, the Japanese military. And so um, we know, for example, that Thonic has taken the Takusago yeah. name as one of their songs. So this is important to contemporary Taiwanese identity. Yeah, so Rowan's um, tale, I do as a hunter's tale. Um, so he was Amis um, and was part of a volunteer. So he volunteered um, to fight uh, for Japan. Um, and his um, story plays out a lot in Papua New Guinea. Um, and so using his tale can help to kind of just to show uh, uh, other ways of kind of talking about Taiwan, right? Um, but I, I, I just felt that, you know, not just like his decisions, uh, but also the kinds of impact that these decisions were being, were being made on indigenous peoples by a colonial authority. And in many cases, for many indigenous people within Taiwan, Japan was the first colonizer, right? Um, because their experiences of colonization didn't include them. Um, and um, so Rome was really part of this. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of include a tale that wasn't just about a resistance to the Japanese colonial authority, though I do talk about it within that chapter, but also one that found ways to work with um and rowan's tale um talks very much about that david uh, thanks very much and i think it's 
spoken at that point. Let's start with the broadest question we look down, and, and that is, uh, you know, how did you choose your 24? And wondering as an author's strategy, did you have this model of Canterbury Tales you took into it? Did you make ad hoc uh, sort of decisions as you went along, or did you have a plan for, for certain types of people when you were certain representatives, certain types when you were thinking about this as a project? And then finally, why the foreigners? Usually, we talk about three here, 24, 24, and I can see colonialism and war that we have in several that you mentioned as being exemplars, but in a book about the tiny long lives of people who didn't get prisoner of war, I want to figure this all that big part of this. So I'm wondering. Pardon me, Nikki. Do I need to repeat the question, Ian? No. It, okay. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Sorry. So I'd like to say that I planned it. Um, it didn't quite work that way. Um, the idea of thinking about a book project that's come from the material that had been collected, but I didn't feel that there was an outlet for that material. I'm finding ways in which that I could revisit some of the people who I have met. Um, and um, I wanted to kind of build a lot around those stories first and then try to see how I could build this in. Um, the 24 tales, um, the final cut of the 24 tales, um was a was a process it was it started off with a different 24 um not perhaps entirely but there were definitely other tales that i wanted to bring in um and um they were tales that are that are in that if i was to rethink the process now that i would maybe move out so that i could give room or voice to other tales um so it was definitely a process that I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do something that's purely chronological, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that there, there is a journey. Um, thinking about where to start was probably one of the hardest bits in making this decision. So in lives in Taiwan, um, where, how far back, do I go? Do I, you know, when you, I would, to address your kind of last question on why include the foreigners in, in Taiwan? Um, I mean, I, I could have chosen a Dutch official. Um, I could have gone back into deeper history, whereas perhaps we had no name, but we, you know, the, the skeleton found in Tainan's scientific mm -hmm. park, for example, might well have provided, but then that just became. A bit of a mess. So it was more in in the kind of that early modern period. So I thought the 19th century was a kind of a starting point, but I wanted to have these conversations very much in a contemporary political and social context. My my reason for choosing a foreign foreigners um, in this is because I wanted to do to include that thematic discussion around them. So it is not. A story of just them. They provide a biography for a wider context. Um, and I, so the conversations around the development of industry in Taiwan in the la late 19th century, I, how that was situated within a wider treaty port system, I felt needed that story. Um, and it provided a very useful backdrop in these different layers of colonization that Taiwan has gone through. Um, and that semi kind of colonial layer of being connected to a treaty port system, but governed in a way that was not the same as the rest. Um, it was a part of the Manchu empire, but it was governed differently to the way in which that the Manchus governed China. And so I wanted to kind of demonstrate in what those ways were and so the biggest one was the ownership of land um foreigners could own land in taiwan but couldn't own land um in in the treaty ports of hangzhou fuzhou right and so that's why you ended up having like a strip this area of leased out property whereas in taiwan that wasn't the case and i wanted to demonstrate the differences as well as the similarities and so um my reason to do that 
Um, the Arthur Wolf one was one where I had questions um, and was, um, and this, is, this, this was a COVID decision to actually choose Arthur's story. Um, largely because what I wanted to do was to talk about those who assisted the American professors going to Taiwan. Um, and in 20, so yeah, 2020, that was lockdown. Yeah, I think that just whole period is just gone, right? Um, I was meant to go to Taiwan. So I, I was in Taiwan every year, apart from the three years gap, hiatus and that. Uh, was to actually do that as the story and then bring in this anthropologist. But because I was working from there, that was um, the reason I didn't do that. The the prisoner of war, I just feel it's an interesting story to be said about the prisoner. And I, so it could have been the prisoner like Jack or it could have been Tony, the child. But then the, I felt the child story of Zhang Bigui, who went to work in Japan, was a better one for a child story. Um, but if I chose the Tang Yu Zone, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk about mining. Um, and so um, it, it felt to me that actually that provided a very useful backdrop. But the idea of these layers of coloniality meant that the lives in Taiwan or of Taiwan um, isn't just Taiwanese, right? People are being shaped, um, or how Taiwan has also shaped people. And that was one of the things which I wanted to get across about how John Dodd lived his life, was shaped by his time in Taiwan, shaped his life afterwards. He talked very much about settling in northern Wales was because it reminded him in some ways of Taiwan. Not quite see how he saw <laughs> that, but, um, you know, each has their own interpretations of their environment, right? So we allow him that freedom to to be expressive that way. But um, I wanted to see how, how the environment influenced people. And one way in which we can do this is to look at this through people who may only have sojourned there for short periods rather than to be born or live their lives out in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, other questions? We have a couple questions from online, um, uh, both from, from Michael J. This is the, the Michael J. that I know. Um, appreciate your questions. Uh, one is one I think that basically David has already asked. So I think that that your answer has, has uh, answered that question. The other is uh, recommendations on best place to get the book. Um, I don't know if, if maybe Molly might be able to answer or Lori might be able to answer. Um, I don't know where. So University of Washington Press website. Um, Michael, if you're the Michael I know, I'd be happy to buy you a copy uh, just outside and you can give me the, the amount back if you want to pick it up here in, on campus. So I'm also making an offer to anyone else who wants me to, to front that while there's a 30% discount. Brilliant. Well, if I could ask a question then. Yep. Um, I think one of my favorite chapters was, I mentioned this to you at lunch, was Li Zhang Mai's chapter. So this yeah. is the, um, one of the most important incidents in Taiwan history was the February 28th incident and the, the commemoration of that has just passed um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the most unknown figures in that incident was the person who was, was pistol whipped and who started the entire event. And that was this, this widow who was selling cigarettes on the black market. Um, and we actually don't know that much about her. And so this was a chapter that you wrote to illuminate that perspective. And I think that really helps to exemplify the history from below that, that you yeah. take. So I'd love to, to hear more thoughts about, um, you know, I think I understood why you cho chose that chapter, but I want to hear it from, from you directly. Yeah, so in many, in many ways, the writer, I, I call this as the hawker's tale, um, because she was selling cigarettes on the street. Um, one of the hardest things about this was actually getting access to material. And again, I mean, I don't want to keep kind of drawing on the problems. I, actually, I didn't have a too bad COVID, to be honest with you. Um, I have a house. I live in the countryside. It's a very rural area. It was a beautiful summer and sitting outside and writing it where the amount of emails kind of really dropped. Um, and it, so I, I, although it was a struggle, it was also a positive thing. But actually writing this chapter 
was one of the hardest chapters to write was namely because of access to material and i think you were really right james actually although much has been said or much has been written about the 228 incident actually there isn't a lot of scholarship on her um much that is is that that's been as a part of a dialogue a conversation in magazines um and those two narratives don't converge these different narratives that there's mainly two 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 stories on on her um and there's a lot of disagreement um and so um wanting to write something that's factual right um proved to be difficult so i had to include both of these stories as a way of doing so this is a chapter really where this is what they say about her rather than this was her um i feel this would have been one again that would have benefited a lot from being able to have done more in-depth archival work in taiwan it's just that wasn't my reality and um but it was a it was an important one there was one of which that i drew a lot of inspiration of the the years of research that shauna yang ryan had written into green island um and i was able to kind of use that wealth of knowledge to help piece this particular chapter together so um it is too also like one of my favorite chapters just because of the story that it tells but actually putting it together was quite a complicated one just on the basis that what we know is so little and um and yet views on her and who she was and where she was at the time um it, 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 there's controversy there's no actual agreement although there's a lot of eyewitness, eyewitness testimony which is where most of the evidence comes from um people witness things differently whether her children were present not present um um and then what happened afterwards um and that becomes really quite important so I, you know i don't want to give too many spoilers away um so um yeah please please enjoy enjoy the struggles of putting this one together and yeah i hope that i hope you could share one small spoiler with us which is the children it, it's just really fascinating that their accounts doesn't seem to accord with what 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 I would have assumed. I don't know if you'd be willing to share a little bit more about um, you know how how their children took a, a different you know you would have expected them to have been very protective of their mother and said yeah. you know this was an awful uh, event of government violence, but that that wasn't the case. Yeah. So um so one of the daughters kind of writes that you know that she, mom was selling cigarettes as usual i was holding a tray of cigarettes close by a soldier looking man came over picked up a cigarette and lit it he didn't pay at first so people started to stare at him he then put his hand into his pocket i thought he was going to get his money but a bodyguard next to me thought he was taking out a gun and so he started to shout what's that man doing in hokkien um, since everyone was speaking in hockey and the soldier couldn't understand and got nervous and thought people were going to hurt him, he left the money and escaped. Um, shortly after, a car came with six or seven police and things got out of hand. Many other cigarette sellers ran away. Mum was unable to run because she was wearing a tube out, um, so like this uh, type of dress. Um, I was too young to escape. Soon mum was attacked and people around me got furious. Um, so this is just kind of to tell you that this was one particular. So others were saying that's not what she was wearing, um, and actually there was no children there. Um, and so you know this is this is from her daughter. Uh, so what I did say is that you know th this is what we do know had happened. What we don't know, and this is where the problems of eyewitness testimony comes through. Um, so it was almost like a courtroom kind of drama was to put all the different sides in but be able to do so by saying like, you know, I'm not going to say that yes, the daughter was there and wasn't there. This is a, this is an interpretation. This is a, this is a part of that tale, her tale. Um, and, um, and then I wanted to kind of put that there. So I also, um, I have the tale. This was an, another one that I wanted to include that 
talks about the 228 incident, and that's George Kurz, one of the writing of Formosa portrayed. And I wanted to put his in because he, and that was really as a way of almost helping to complement this one where we have this almost this kind of lack of kind of, you know, of, 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 of evidence to be able to say that here we have another account. And again, we can kind of see how those stories converge, but also about how this was just different. But what we do know is that this is something that happened um, and we know how it played out. Um, but what triggered it and how it was started, this does have different narratives. Um, and the importance is actually these are the different stories about her and her life. She was a real person. Um, she, this is what happened to her. It, it was, it may not have been the main cause that triggered it. This was around the issue of language, which is one I wanted to put across this idea that the soldier didn't understand what they were saying. They didn't understand what he was saying. And that's where that kind of go back to that part, beginning part of when I was talking about this kind of the linguistic diversity you know, that we talk about, kind of, we think about Taiwan as ocean, we can think about indigenous languages, those that have, you know, have become extinct, those who are dying out, and those that are finding rejuvenation, right, almost. Um, but here we have another set of languages that can move into Taiwan, um, both, both the languages that came in as part of colonial settlement, but now these new languages that were coming in. Whereas although Mandarin would become the national language, there was not necessarily the language that was being spoken by the soldiers that were coming over. And so this chapter really wanted to kind of just kind of encapsulate that element. And that was the thing that I said was perhaps the trigger. It doesn't matter whether her children were there or not there. That's in many ways is irrelevant detail. What matters was is actually the complexities and layers of all these different things are coming together and this was a trigger point. Yeah. So much of the assumption of the current historiography is that the agents of the Tobacco and Alcohol Monopoly Bureau explicitly sought out the, the hawker, the, the widow, yeah. because she was selling them illegally. But based on the daughter's account, it was all based on misunderstanding that you know this, this um, agent was merely looking to purchase cigarettes and was mistaken as trying to take them and that this became the trigger point. So it's, it's actually a very, it's a small, but a very important potential revision to our historical understanding of February yeah. 28th. And as you mentioned, it, it tells us about the complexity of language in Taiwan during this period. Okay, oh, uh, we have two more questions. Um, okay, Lori first then. Okay, um, just a general question. How do you envision this book being used in teaching? What, what kinds of classes and if, in your own teaching and how would you dole it out to your students? It be um, I think, I mean, I don't, I mean, for me, um, in, in the teaching would be to drop in and out rather than, so to have this as a, as a, as a text where, yeah, this, this, this will help to kind of shape an understanding of Taiwan and the different layers within this. But um, if we are to say, so I have a class on Taiwan in the Asia Pacific. Um, and so the way in which that book can do, can do this, so if we had a class on activism, for example, we can draw on a number of chapters from this book to help shape a wider conversation of activism in Taiwan. So we could look at, Shoki Ko's chapter. Um, I also have the pop star's tale, which has or elements of the kind of activism embedded within this. Um, we have Fan Yun's chapter is a chapter of activism. So, um, so I would probably look at how these different tales can help to complement a wider conversation and to give it. Um, to give it a face in certain ways. So uh, you mentioned that you took the students and characters to your second time that you were working through it, and you also mentioned a couple of the ones that you wanted to put in but then tried to not to. I was wondering if there are one or two others that you might want to talk about who you decided to cut, um, why you cut them, and what you feel the 
book may have lost by putting them, there are other issues that you wanted to cover that you didn't mention. Yes, um, interesting. So now, because the cutting of them was done some time ago now, so um, they sit within that box. Um, um, so just thinking, so I state in the introduction part that I wanted to do as much as I can of looking at the ordinary person rather than to look at it from a top down um, and, you know, to choose the president's tail is very much a top down is not an ordinary is not from below right it is very much so um what i wanted to those that i haven't included um there was one tale that i wanted to do which was the diaspora tale um was to look at a story of a taiwanese person someone taiwan born but has lived outside and actually i contemplated using Shawnee Yang Ryan as mm. the study for that. So her writing Green Island was as a writer, an American writer. Um, and I, I thought about that. And I, I, in certain ways, I would love to have included that, that one, but it would be, it was, it was that, that or the president's tale. And I just, and that, that was the was thing I wanted to kind of end on the diaspora. Um, and it just felt a bit kind of like it was, that was a hard, that was a tough one. So what I did instead was to kind of put Sean Yangrong's narrative through most of the chapters mm -hmm. has elements of Green Island within it. Um, and so because the book would not because her chapter would not have been about her book, it would have been about being a Taiwanese outside um, within the diaspora and. Um, yeah, so that would be one example of, of of somebody who I wanted to include and didn't. Um, when I put in the one of epidemiologist tale, um, that one was one that I felt was needed to be put in, but was never was never because COVID wasn't a thing that had happened when this was first being conceptualized. Um, and so, you know, had COVID not happened, then there is the possibility that that may well have been different. Um, and it may well have influenced others. Um, and my decisions of some of them, you know, was to have more ordinary people, people who only going to appear in this book, potentially, right? Um, and I would have perhaps considered more of those tales if I had the opportunity to have done ethnographic work within Taiwan, um, um, there may well have been more. And if that had been the case, then it'd be one where there is there is work written on these people. And I would have perhaps made the decision to include people where they're not written in. But circumstances meant that I had to bring this combination of people who fortunately I had done work with prior and it was a case of going through those boxes um but it wasn't new people yeah any other questions last chance we have about five minutes left so bill Okay, so current work, now that I'm able to get back 
to doing field work. Um, I'm, I'm working on a way to understand different knowledge systems. So I, we, I had to, we were briefly speaking about this over lunch. Um, it's, it's trying the best way to kind of articulate it because for for a long time it's just sat within my own head. Um, and it's a way in which that people get a sense of feeling um, about their environment. And it's how do we, or how can we document feeling? Um, people's sense of intuition. Um, and I'm looking, or I've looked for a while about whether or not that can we measure feelings? And if we can measure feelings, can that measurement feed into like the IPCC report on climate change? Um, and it's, and then I kind of had a I'm almost like an epiphany that perhaps we don't need to measure it. We don't need to quantify that, but rather it could help to feed into a solution um, in terms of how people adapt to their environments by using knowledge systems, right? Um, people can use it to help build resilience within communities. And so my project with Taiwan as I'm beginning to start putting Taiwan as a case study within this. I also work um, on the Henya, the female sea divers in South Korea, um, uh, whose work I also, I do. Um, and I have have field work in, this year in Papua New Guinea as well. So I'm working on a project that looks at whether or not that people communicate climate change similar or different, whether they live in high altitude cultures or low altitude, i.e. under the sea. Um, and so I'm currently working on that. But with relations to moving forward with Taiwan, um, I have a project idea around indigenous beekeepers. Um, and um, I don't know whether or not that that will be presented biographically, but there's no reason why it can't be. Um, but I'm looking at kind of, because beekeepers just, it's something that fascinates me. I mean, I, I'm not... You know, I thought it's what you know, like one of those ones that you think as you're getting older, like beekeeping and bell ringing. Um, I, I, but I don't really have the time to 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 look after bees. But I would <laughs> I would love to do this. But instead, it's good that you can then research people who do look after the bees. Um, but what fascinates me about beekeepers is the extent of their knowledge to be able to make sense of the world around them by just having a feeling like the weather, um, you know, a feeling around, okay, it's going to rain today. Just, it, I can smell it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, you know, I can smell it's going to rain. So they would know how to best look after the bees just through how they feel. Um, and more often or not, their feelings um, are correct. I mean, we, we, we all have elements of these kind of um, feelings. So, you know, there's the, saying that a red sky at night is a shepherd or a sailor's delight and the red sky in the morning is a warning right uh, i mean again this is about an interpretation of deep knowledge systems and so um my to answer kind of in a very long way sorry bill um that my next taiwan project will be to build on this sense of how people can make sense of the environment and changes within that environment through their feelings. I will be looking at indigenous beekeepers. Um, but I'm glad that you um, mentioned about the biographical things. I, this was really that kind of thing that I've done and not really thought that I would follow a similar style. Um, but there isn't any reason why it can't be a book of beekeepers tales, right? <laughs> Um, that may that may be it. Maybe it was it was born here. Thank, I, I acknowledge you, Bill, that the inspiration <laughs> for it came came here, right here is where is it. So if you see a future book with UW Press on the Beekeeper's Tales, um, it's thanks to Bill. <laughs> and with that note, we are now at time. So let's give another round of applause for Nikki. Thank you so much, Nikki.